Let's get joined up. This week's show is sponsored by Bandcamp.com, an online record store and music community where passionate fans discover, connect with, and directly support the artists they love. There's thousands of bands and artists on there, including my band, The Rye Dogs, whose second album, Pigs Might Fly, is out right now. Here's a quick snippet of the title track, which is also available on Spotify. Because your eyes may be weeping, but your conscience is sleeping. It's totally free to join Bandcamp, and as the Rye Dogs are brand new members, we're now looking to grow our fan base, so your support would be greatly appreciated. Just search the Rye Dogs, that's W R Y Dogs, and hit the follow button. Right, now we can cue the theme tune. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 163 with Sarah Bonner, debut author of the seriously twisty psychological thriller Her Perfect Twin. Sarah's got loads to say about her unique path to publication, how her organisational skills have helped her with both the business and the creative side of writing, and how she uses the five whys to drill down into her characters and write such amazing plots. I suppose I should say Happy New Year if it's not too late, as another year has rolled around since the last episode, and I also need to apologise for such a long gap. The day job's been really especially busy for the last few months, and in addition to trying to keep rolling with my novel, it's been tricky to find time to record a new show. Speaking of the novel, I'm now very much in the last act of the story, approaching 80,000 words on whatever version of safe hands this is, and I'm desperately trying to wrangle all my plot threads into a satisfying and logical ending. I won't lie, it's been really tricky. Every time I think I've got it straight, another problem rears its ugly head, and as I record this intro, I think I'm about 95% of the way there with it, but I still have to resolve a couple of plot puzzles... You know, you think it all holds together and then you remember there are two characters standing in the room that now have no purpose or any input on proceedings. So why are they there? Okay, I'll take them out. But that just breaks it in a different way. So you put one back in and you leave the other one out and now you've got a new problem that's different to the past two issues that you had. So on and on and on it goes. Um, I've found verbalising the story in some way helps to sort it out in your mind. Um, and that might be telling a writer friend or someone who's at least a bit familiar with your book, talking it through and asking for feedback. But sometimes just the act of just saying it out loud anyway or trying to email it to someone, that seems to kind of crystallise it for me because my tiny brain is too feeble to hold it all in my memory at the same time. So I have to get it out and just work through it that way. And people like today's guest, Sarah Bonner, actually, and Erica Waller from my critique group, they've been great sounding boards for a lot of this stuff. So thanks a lot for that. And of course, once you then start writing the scenes, it often changes again, but there's no getting away from it. It's just hard work and you just have to crack on with it and embrace the process. You could just accept the easy option and the first solution that comes to mind with all this stuff. But in my experience, that's usually the most obvious and boring idea. And if it's boring and obvious to me, it's almost certainly going to be that for the reader. So... Anyway, let's hope by the next show I've got it figured out and I've written the end on this first draft, which is actually not a first draft because, you know, how long have I been writing this book on and off? But it is a completely different book to all the other versions that I've written before. So that's me. But what about you? What have you all been up to in the last couple of months? How are your projects going? You know I love to hear from you all, so do drop me a line. I try to reply to every message and it's brilliant to hear what you're up to, what you think works or doesn't with the show or if there's anything you'd like to hear more of in future episodes. The best way to get in touch is via email, wayne at waynekellywrites.com but you can also tweet me at jupodcast or drop me a line on the FB page. Also, don't forget to join the email mailing list at join.writing.co.uk. It's totally free and you get a couple of downloadable goodies when you sign up as well as being the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Right, let's hear today's interview with Sarah Bonner. 
So as a teenager, Sarah dreamt of a career as a writer and performer, so instead she became an accountant. And after a 15-year career, she finally decided to answer her original calling and began her first novel. And now we arrive at her debut, the brilliant psychological thriller Her Perfect Twin, which since this recording I finished and I loved. Uh, and that book is out right now everywhere you can find good books. So enjoy the chat and I'll pop back at the end for a sign-off. Hi Sarah, thanks a million for coming on Joined Up Writing, really appreciate it. So why don't you just start off just by telling us how things are going and tell us where you're speaking from as well. Okay, well absolutely fantastic uh, to be on the show, so thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, my house in, well just outside of East Grinstead in Sussex. Um, I am in what is going to be becoming my home office because we've finally decided to actually convert the spare room two years into the pandemic <laughs> into an actual office space so I don't have to sit on the bed or on the sofa and write, which is what I've been doing for the last two years because my husband stole my writing desk to work from home. So you can do your next, you can write your next books in style then, in comfort. Yeah with a proper desk and a proper chair and everything so yes very much looking forward to that so uh yeah exciting exciting stuff and speaking of exciting stuff why don't you tell us about your debut novel her perfect twin okay so her perfect twin is a psychological thriller um it follows the story of megan who is kind of early mid-30s woman she's stuck in a very toxic marriage um, and a not overly exciting job. She's a management consultant and former accountant. Um, I am also we'll come a back former to that, accountant, yeah. so we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, and essentially, she's also an identical twin, although she's estranged from her identical twin, Leah, who isn't the nicest person in the world. Mm -hmm. Leah essentially spent most of their lives making Megan's life very, very difficult stealing all of her staff, um, including some boyfriends earlier on in their lives. And the uh, the novel opens when Megan discovers that her husband and her identical twin have been having an affair. Mm -hmm. So she goes to confront her sister. They have a little bit of a disagreement. And basically, Megan accidentally kills her. <laughs> so I say accidentally, she didn't go intending to kill her, but eh, she does. <laughs> so um, in order to try and get away with it, uh, she decides that she will try and live both of their lives. So essentially this idea that if no one knows that Leah's actually dead, then Megan can't be accused of her murder. So Megan tries very hard to live both lives which is never easy and particularly difficult uh when the country goes into lockdown in march 2020 mm. so i set part of the novel in lockdown uh, to kind of use that as a bit of a plot mechanism which is uh was very very interesting to to write and kind of explore uh some of those elements in the novel as well so the pandemic's really convenient for you. <laughs> uh, <again. laughs> Don't worry. Oh, I hate this one because there's, there's always this kind of... I'm only joking. Uh, uh, yes, I've used it. It's not a pandemic book. Um, it doesn't really talk much about COVID. Uh, it more uses lockdown. It's a, a nice It's a nice little device, isn't it, for you? I used it as a plot device, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm currently reading it and loving it. I'm quite early on, but I'm loving it. So it's kind of a it's a it's a great premise. So do you remember kind of what kicked off the idea for you in the first place? Yes, it actually started as a short story. So mm -hmm. I, like most writers, I'd been writing something. I've been working on something for a very long time that wasn't really working and I decided to take a bit of a step back and uh, spend a little bit more time writing some short stories and I set myself a challenge in August of 2020 that I would write a thousand words every day didn't matter what it was uh, or if it was any good but I'd kind of get into that habit and I started writing this short story about a woman who was trying to decide if she should go on a second date with this guy that she'd met 
but this guy thought that she was her identical twin. So it actually started with kind of a little bit of a love story element to it. And then um, I was wrapping up the short story and I wanted it to have a bit of a sting in the tail. Mm -hmm. And the sting was that she'd killed her sister and she was pretending to be her to get away with the murder. And then I wrote something else that had a body in a freezer and a woman (laughs) trying to convince her mother-in-law that she hadn't actually killed her husband and he was just unable to come to the phone because he was in the shower or he was in the garden or whatever. Um, And then a friend of mine and I were talking about lockdown and how difficult it would be for people who lived these double lives. So, um, you know, where you have um, men particularly who have this kind of second family and what would they do? in lockdown where you actually suddenly have to be at home and how would they choose which family to go to Mm. and that whole dynamic um and then i was just out one day walking the dog and i suddenly realized that i could put those three elements together and there was a book there there was enough material potentially hopefully to to create a book and i remember coming home from walking the dog and i sat down and i wrote a synopsis of the whole story and i thought okay actually yeah that could be a book yeah that's Um, great and we were this was yeah end of the summer of 2020 and we were kind of thinking that we might go back into restrictions and it was all it was all looking a bit bleak and i think i just um i took writing her perfect twin as a bit of an escapism from what was really going on in the rest Mm, of the world. Yeah. And so I managed to write the whole thing and do, I think I did three, four or maybe four drafts of it and had some people read it and comment and integrate their comments. And I wrote it basically start to finish in about 14 weeks, which is ridiculously fast. Yeah. And I will always caveat that with, I'd been made redundant because of COVID. I don't have children. And so, and I, you know, there was no social life at that point in the pandemic either. So I didn't have a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. You you were, unlike the rest of us, you avoided all the Netflix um, box sets and you actually did some work. Well, I'd I'd watched all of those (laughs) earlier in the pandemic. You'd run out, (laughs) completed Netflix. We'd run run out of stuff. And um, my husband plays a computer game um that had uh he they just launched an update to it and so he was playing that a lot as well and so i just thought you know i'm just gonna take this time and while the story's there and it wants to come out just get it down on paper and i think that's how i write best i write best quite quickly yeah while it's kind of white the the idea is kind of white hot or whatever so yeah. so obviously you started off like you say like with your first short story that you're writing it it, it was more it had a lot more kind of a not romance, but it was more of like a love story. And then obviously the dark thing came in at the end and your other story was this, you know, something that had murder in it. So it, I'm getting the sense, and obviously this the book is a gripping psychological thriller. So is that the type of book that you're kind of drawn to yourself to read? Tell us some of your influences in terms of authors or books, would you say? So I read a lot of thrillers mm-hmm. um, and I always have read thrillers. So I remember, I think I was about 10 and I'd read everything in the children's section of our local library, which was quite small, but also I read a lot. I don't remember watching TV as a kid. I remember just always reading. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'd exhausted the children's section. And I think my mom was a bit reticent to um, let me read stuff that might have sex scenes in it. Yeah. And so for some reason, she thought it was absolutely fine that therefore I'd read thrillers. Um, <laughs> because I think thrillers, particularly at that point, because this was kind of early mid 90s, mm. it, it was either you had lots and lots of action or you had lots of a different type of action. Yeah, um, bedroom action. Yeah. Sexy <laughs> time. Like, all right, you know, <laughs> death and horrors, that's all fine. Um <laughs> And so I think the first adult book I read was Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. Um, and then went through uh, Stephen King and mm. Dean Koontz and all of those kind of writers, um, which 
looking back on it, probably not what you should encourage an 11 12 year old to be reading. But anyway, um, so I think that always influenced what I enjoyed. And I've always been really, really interested in that idea of um, this kind of evil that lives amongst us and looks like the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the the characters in the book, um, Megan's husband, Chris, he's not a very nice man Mm. and he's kind of inspired by some of that um idea that actually you can be really really rotten but still present yourself in a way so that most of the world doesn't realize that that's who you are um this sounds really quite macabre and like i was a very very strange (laughs) no i i I relate to it because i was the same i i read a lot of those types of books probably at a similar age to you like the, especially Stephen King and things I remember reading I think Salem's Lot was the first Stephen Stephen King book that I read and I was probably about 12 or something um at the time so I was the same but I think my, I think my mom read a lot of um those kind of books at the time I think she was um she had a phase where she was into James Herbert and she liked I remember her reading oh, yeah. Rats um and that ha- I do remember that that actually did have a sex scene in it, which I remember. And I was only really young and I was like, oh my God, um, blown away by that. But I, yeah, the, I was similar. I think I think the whole thing with it is, is, is if you're quite an early reader, like you say, you kind of burn through stuff quite quickly. And then it's like, right, now I've got like this key where I can just go and read stuff. Because the thing with books as well, it's not like, you know, blockbuster video or something where it's got an 18 on it. Or, and you know you can't get it, and you need a you need a ID or something to get it. They just let you have books. That's the thing that I always used to think. Yeah, they do. And I think our um, our librarian did raise a few eyebrows occasionally of some of the things that I was taking out of the library. But mm. then, um, yeah, my my parents were quite um, were quite open minded in terms of that. Um, as long as it didn't traumatize me, it was fine. Yeah. Um, I think it was always their view. So that was fine. And my mum's a huge reader as well. So, um, you know, our, our house was just always filled with books. Yeah. Um, I went back um, to my parents' house for Christmas this year. And I'm just, I just watered in every room. There's just books piled on every available <laughs> surface. Um, and... Yeah, I'm sure that some of them haven't been read, um, but I know some of them have been read many, many times over. Um, and so, yeah, we just there were always books everywhere. Um, I went through a stage in my kind of 20s that I didn't read very much um, while I was doing my accountancy exams. Um, and so there's a <clears throat> I had this kind of weird gap of about 10 years where I didn't really read anything new. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm now kind of rectifying that and going back through some of those things that I would have missed at that time, which is quite nice. Um, and I also read a lot of, again, this is going to sound really macabre, um, kind of dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction as well. So I've always really uh, enjoyed. You're drawn, you're drawn to the darker side of things. Yeah, basically. Um, which yeah like so so many people are it's like it's there's a reason it's like one of the most popular genres so it's totally understandable so so tell us a little bit more about your background kind of where you grew up and what your earliest memory of writing is so um i grew up in wiltshire so just outside of salisbury um and i was I was a very nerdy child. Um, not going to lie about it. Um, <laughs> we, like, yeah, very so academic, was I. very never got in trouble um, at all, really. Yeah, all, all quite dull. Um, but <laughs> I was also a dancer for a long time. So I um, went to ballet school when I was 14 for a couple of years, although subsequently discovered I wasn't actually very good, which is always a fun thing to find out um and then kind of moved a lot more into to doing quite a lot of youth theater um and had an ambition to be a playwright and then i don't quite really understand what happened but somehow i became an accountant <laughs> uh, as you do um so i went to university i did a hospitality degree and then um became an accountant i uh, did that for well about 15 years um and then 
uh, moved more into project management and project development, which is it's not unexciting, uh, but it's certainly not particularly creative. Um, creativity is generally discouraged in the accounting. <laughs> yeah, strange that. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, a couple of years ago, it's probably more than a couple, actually, it's about four or five years ago, I started writing something that had been in the back of my mind for a long time. Um, and just something said to me, just just write it down and see where it goes. And so I spent a couple of years writing a book and editing a book that isn't great. Mm-hmm. I might go back to it at some point um, and work it. It's the book that again. you kind of learn to write on, though, which exactly. lots of people do that. Yeah, exactly. It was the, the book that made me realise that actually uh, you do need to uh, develop your characters and you do need to have uh, some idea of a plot. And, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I had been writing that and I'd got to a point with that where I didn't quite know what to do with it. And I started thinking about maybe doing a writing course. So looked at things like Faber Academy um, or potentially even doing a master's. And then COVID happened. And so I'd gone from worrying about the amount of time I might have to put into something like a writing course to having lots of time. But also having been made redundant, so not having the um, the kind of financial security to go and spend quite a lot of money on some yeah. of these expensive courses. And so I said to myself, right, I need to figure out if I want to write this one book or if I want to write more generally. Mm-hmm. And if I want to write more generally, then I will invest in it. But if it's just because I want to write this one book that I've been laboring over for two years, that might not be a good investment. Um, You can see the accountant comes out. (laughs) So, yeah, you did the strengths and weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Yeah. (laughs) And then I and so I said to myself, look, just spend a couple of months, um, read a lot more, read some more craft books and uh, books around structure and characterization and, you know, all of those kind of cornerstones of writing um, and write some short stories and I've wrote some flash fiction and and that kind of stuff. And then, um, and then, you know, see how you get on and see how you feel at the end of those kind of couple of months. Um, because it was going to be obvious that I wasn't going to find a job immediately um, because I worked in aviation and there were there wasn't going to be anyone hiring over the summer of 2020, let's put it that way. No, absolutely. Um, and, yeah, while I was doing that, I had the idea for Her Perfect Twin, wrote it, and then had a slightly awkward kind of zoom drinks session with my old colleagues where they all went so Sarah what are you doing and I went I wrote a book and it just kind of came out I'd had a couple of glasses of wine by this point and it just kind of came out that I'd actually not been looking for a job but had instead been writing this book and uh my previous boss said well send it around then <laughs> and I knew that these were people who, if it was awful, they'd tell me. Yeah. Which actually is really, really useful. So I sent it round to them and kind of had that couple of weeks of like palpitations around the fact that I'd actually just sent my work out to about eight yeah. of my colleagues. And they all came back and said, No, actually this is this is good. Keep going. And I was like, Okay, this is this is fine, okay. Yeah, that's great. So uh, So you knew you were on the right path. <laughs> From their opinion, I was, yes. But it um, must have given you enough encouragement to just, as you say, keep you keep you going with it. Yes, and and to start thinking about packaging it up and sending it out. Yeah. Um, which is, I think, there's. it's always really difficult as a new writer to know when your work is at the stage to be sending it to someone else. Mm-hmm. So to, to be thinking about literary agents or um, if you are self-publishing or... If you're going to publishers directly, kind of, you know, what is that point at which it's 
it's as good as you can make it. And yeah. how do you ever judge that? I think yeah. it's, it's a difficult one to absolutely, not. especially with that input from anybody else. So, to, so on that subject, what was your original path to, to your, you know, your path to publication? How did you, how did that, you know, you go from there to actually, you know, the book that's about to come out as we speak? So I was incredibly lucky, um, and it was really quite quick. Uh, for me. So I have a tendency to massively overanalyze things, <laughs> being an accountant. Uh, so when I decided that I was going to start uh, thinking about sending this to agents, I made a massive spreadsheet with every agent uh, in the UK and what they represented and what they all wanted. And I spent probably three weeks building this. Mm -hmm. It's it's essentially a database. Yeah. Um, and trying to figure out who might be a good fit um, for what I'd written. Um, and so I narrowed it down to a list of about 15 agents um, and then gave them all a rank. It all got very complicated. <laughs> um, and then I was just checking some of the final kind of submission guidance because every agent has a specific way that they want you to present the data or the information mm -hmm. and you know do they want three chapters or 50 pages or 10,000 words or yeah they all have slightly different requirements and i was just confirming it and i noticed on dh uh, literary who were one of my top choices that they had a pitching competition running um where essentially you send in uh, your synopsis and a covering letter and the first 5,000 words, and they select a um, a number of people to then have a session one-on-one -on -one with one of their agents, um, both to talk about their book from a kind of representation perspective, but also to get some feedback on your pitch pack. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, this is, uh, this sounds good. The deadline was the next day. I hadn't written my synopsis. I hadn't written a covering letter. I'd researched how to do these things, but I hadn't actually put pen to paper. And so I spent the next kind of day desperately trying to write um, the, the kind of supporting documents and make sure the first couple of chapters were all checked and then sent it off, um, I think, hours before they closed. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of days later, I had an email back from them to say they'd like to offer me a pitching slot. And because it was so close to the deadline, that pitching slot was literally kind of a week after I'd originally submitted. So there wasn't much waiting around. There was no waiting around. I had a chat uh, on Zoom with Hannah um, and she said to me, uh, I really like the idea. Send me the full. So I sent her the full and she emailed me on the Sunday evening to say she'd read it. She really liked it. Could we chat on the Monday? And then she offered to represent me on the Monday. So it was literally 10 days <laughs> from wow. original submission to getting the offer. And, you know, Hannah and I have talked about it since. And it was so, so lucky that the timing was just so perfect that she happened to be looking for something that was a thriller um at that time she was open to taking on a new client because that was one of the reasons that they had the pitching event um and yeah just all the kind of pieces i suppose just fell into it, place yeah the timing's lucky sarah but the, it's like with any of this stuff you know there's a saying about um you know your ship coming in or whatever but when your ship comes in you've kind of got to be ready to row out to meet it and you were you were ready, you know, you had the stuff ready and you had a good, a good premise and a good book and all the rest of it. It, it, you know, you could have seen that and not had any of that stuff. And so it would have been irrelevant. Yeah, it was. Um, it, yeah. And I, and I had done a lot of research to make sure that she was the right exactly person. the right agent yeah, as yeah. well. Um, and, um, and now, I mean, she, she's absolutely brilliant, but I also have someone who is the best person for recommending books as well. So, cause we have almost identical reading tastes, oh, brilliant. um, which was one of the things that I looked for in an agent was someone, um, cause on their website, they'd always say, you know, these are the manuscripts, the types of things that I'm looking for. 
And then generally most agents will say, and this is what I personally like to read. Yeah. And I figured, well, I've written a book that's something I'd want to read. So if I find an agent who likes to read the same stuff that I read, she's more likely, or she or he, is more likely then to like what I've written. Yeah. was my logic that seemed to have worked. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So do you remember when you got that call on the Monday or whenever it was, or, or she, you know, she said that she wants to talk to you on the Monday and then, you know, because she'd asked for the full and she said that she liked it and she said, can I, can I speak to you on Monday? Do you remember getting that email or whatever and how did you feel when you got it? So it was a really weird time because um, on the day that I'd had my pitching, uh, well, my pitch, um my mom bless her had quite a bad fall and was in hospital well, right and um and so the whole getting representation is slightly tinged with that memory all i wanted to do was because my mom had always been my first reader as well so she'd read every iteration of her perfect twin from kind of mom i've got a bit of an idea what do you think all the way through to me submitting it yeah and i couldn't tell her because she was in hospital and i couldn't contact her and so it was it was a very bizarre time because you've got this huge piece of news sure yeah so it's a little and bit sad, a bit, bit a little bittersweet really it it was a little bit and then actually by the time that mom recovered and was kind of in a position to chat on the phone and stuff um we were already at submission out to editors stage so yeah. um it was yeah it was a really odd time and also when hannah rang me to offer to represent me we were having internet problems and i couldn't hear her properly and <laughs> It kept cutting out, and so we had to then jump onto a Zoom, and it was all a bit of a disaster. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not quite the Hollywood moment that some people might imagine. No, but it's um, yeah, it 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 is what it is. I oh, suppose. it's great. So, um, so, so once she she'd taken you on, obviously, and then it goes out to submission. How did it go from there, and how did you feel when you knew it was actually being? sent out to publishers or whatever i think that's i think that's the the point where it becomes much more real mm -hmm. um and there is a slightly odd thing where um i think when you start writing you want to finish the book and then uh when you start submitting it to agents the you know the next thing is get an agent yeah and i think for most writers you don't necessarily think beyond that point. No, I think you're right. That's the that's always seen as like the big hurdle. It is, yeah, um, the first big thing to get past. Yeah, and also um, if you if you are like me, that I'm a serial researcher, and I spent loads of time on Reddit and things like that, getting advice on how you pitch to agents. There is nothing. There's no real information out there about what happens after you've got an agent. Yeah. Um, and so there's this slight black box where you don't really know what's happening. And I mean, my agent's fantastic and she keeps me, um, appraised of what's going on. And if I, you know, I sometimes just email her with like just random questions. <laughs> she loves those emails from me. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's that, there's that weird time where you are no longer in control of it either. And I like to be in control of stuff. Um, of just knowing that it's out there and people are reading it. Um, but yeah, so basically it's, it's just basically weeks of just constantly checking my emails just in case, um, which is crazy because of course, the second that we had an offer, Hannah rang me. She didn't just email me and say, we've had an offer. <laughs> rang me. So I don't know why I'd been obsessively checking my emails for months. Um, and yeah, so about, I think we were on sub for about four weeks. Uh -huh. And we'd had some um, passes. In. Uh, no, we'd had a lot of passes right. and I'd had a couple of people. So, of course, the best time to pitch a pandemic set novel <laughs> or a lockdown set novel 
is just as we go back into another major lockdown <laughs> in January 2021, uh, which is literally what happened. And there were a couple of editors who said, um, I don't want to go anywhere near it if it's even referencing COVID. Right. Um, which is interesting, really. It, it is. And I think... Um, and I think that was just at the point in time where we were with the pandemic, where people were starting to realise that maybe this wasn't going to be the it'll be over next week situation that mm. we, I think, convinced ourselves during the first lockdown that, you know, oh, a couple of months and it'll be over. And yeah. then we kept saying this. Of like, yeah, we're still saying when it. COVID's <laughs> done, when COVID's done. And, and I think, yeah, last January was that point where everyone was going, well, maybe it's not done. Mm. And I think we've now got to a point where, um, although I think there are a lot of people who don't want to read a pure pandemic novel per se, mm. that recognition that it did happen and is still happening, mm. um, I think people have got a little bit more comfortable with because you know we're two years in now. This hasn't. Yeah, this absolutely. Is, this and like you nothing. say, it's it is more of a it's it, for you. It's really it's a handy plot device that, that gives you this added level of um suspense isn't it really yes yeah and it you know it could have been done in a different way and we did consider um at one point should we take that out but actually i i think i think it works in the setting of the mm. novel and then, like i say it's a different way of looking at it is it make it does make it feel like really really contemporary and up to date um, because, you know, I think most people, if you're anything like me, it's kind of, we kind of feel like we've lost a year anyway. So when you talk about the pandemic, in my mind, it's last year when actually, I mean, obviously we're still in the pandemic, but I'm talking about the start of the pandemic. To, in my mind, it's like a year ago when actually it's two years ago now as we I speak, know. which is ridiculous. And And I think that's really hammered at home for me how long it's been that I literally have start and i had an idea i've taken a novel from idea to publication in mm. this time so i um you know in march 2020 i went home from work um we had the press conference that said you now need to work from home i never went back no and so i literally just you know went home for the evening from work yeah. and then two years later, I've published a novel. It's, it's a very bizarre... <laughs> it's surreal, yeah. It feeds into the whole surreal feeling of the whole time. Yeah. So on that subject, you're talking about this previous career, this, the, you know, the career you had as a, an accountant and um, your project manager and all the rest of it, you know, as you say, it would seem like it's a million miles away from a writing career. But do you think any of the skills you kind of honed in the business world have stood you in good stead for being an author and if so what sorts of things are we looking at i think there are there are a couple of things that are hugely helpful um so from a, an actual writing itself perspective or being or you know writing a whole novel having some of those project management skills mm -hmm. are really useful so you know how you can break something down into smaller parts and keeping yourself motivated um going through that present it it takes a huge amount of time to write something that's novel length and keeping yourself motivated through all of those different stages um so that's that's massively helpful to have that kind of project management background and i treat it in a similar way mm -hmm. uh, so there are stages and you go through those stages and i have spreadsheets where i tick off progress and things um so that's really really helpful um there are also i'm in addition to being a project manager i'm also a change manager um, which is much more around process improvement mm -hmm. and actually um, process mapping and plotting are really similar uh because you know you start at a point and you end somewhere and you go on a journey through that so i use a lot of my old um mapping uh, methodologies when I'm plotting. So I have a, a huge wall which is covered in this stuff called magic whiteboard that basically converts your wall into a whiteboard and sticky notes and I will plot like that onto a wall which my husband loves because <laughs> the only wall that we have big enough is in our bedroom 
<laughs> and so for, for certain points in the plotting process, our bedroom wall is basically covered in my ideas on how to murder people, how to get away with murdering people. It's all good fun. <laughs> At one point I did have um, a section on that that was titled how can she kill her husband and get away with it <laughs> or a different story? Um, and yeah, he's watching That's worrying. Movie. Yeah. When he wakes up and sees that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um, so yeah, so mapping is, is really, really useful. Um, and it helps with things like how you deal with time as it flows through and, and those kind of things. Um, and also I think coming from a business background um, into the publishing industry, I think has helped me from a a kind of mental health perspective of keeping things in perspective because it's hugely emotional to to write a book and to get it published and to put something creative out there that's kind of you know it is your baby and you tie yourself to your book in a way that you don't do for you know doing uh, finance reports and things um but i think for me recognizing that publishing is a business Mm -hmm. um has helped me to navigate some of those things within publishing that seem a little incongruous and a little bit strange um and i think it's just kind of kept me um kept me a little bit sane being able to say you know when stuff happens in publishing that you think is a little bit odd I can just put it back into business terms and go okay yeah that actually does make sense if you contextualize it like that um so you can think of it more as a kind of a product or whatever yes and you know it's it's difficult to do because you are intrinsically linked of to course, it yeah this is the result of me at you know 11 o'clock at night still writing and um you do put a lot of yourself into it, even with a thriller that is, you know, about identical twins. And I'm not an identical twin. <laughs> well, so you say, what's happened to you? <laughs> what's happened to your sister? That's what we want to know. <laughs> well, my mum did message me recently to say, I'm really glad that we're your parents and you're an identical twin. And I was like, I don't have an identical twin. And my mum was like, no, <laughs> not anymore. Um, yeah, and then someone said to me, you should go around saying that you don't currently have an identical twin. You should, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so only, you know, even when you write something that is quite different, there is there is elements of you in it and there are anecdotes that are things that actually you know about um i just sent a copy today to my best friend um and i had to put a little note in it to say you might recognize something in i think it's in the the first couple of pages where she makes a reference to something one of her friends does Mm -hmm. um that is something that one of of my friends did (laughs) um and you know so things like that that you do put parts of yourself into it of course Um, and so it is very difficult to separate yourself from your book but i think the more you can do that the easier it is when you then get into that publishing cycle and you're waiting around and there's the rejection and all the rest of it that comes with it yeah and then when you inevitably get the odd bad review it's a lot easier i think just to kind of take that bit of step back from it and say well you know you can't please everyone and it is ultimately a product and you can't change it at this point anyway so um yeah just go with it yeah so so what you you mentioned that obviously and i've been lucky enough to sit on a video call before i've seen that famous plotting wall that you're talking about <laughs> or at least a little bit of it so on that subject obviously especially in the genre that you know her perfect twin is in and uh, the kind of genre that you're drawn to plotting is really really key so have you got any kind of little quick little tips or anything that's kind of helped you with with plotting or that you kind of bear in mind when you when you're plotting a book so interestingly with her perfect twin i didn't actually really plot that Mm -hmm. in huge detail i started with because i started it with this short story and it started really with megan as a character um that the plot kind of came along afterwards and then involved quite a lot of knitting backwards sure 
So, um, and trying to put those breadcrumbs in. And eventually, I think, um, you know, fair play to any thriller writer that can do it. But eventually, you do have to put it all up on some kind of murder wall and make sure that, you know, you've referenced something in chapter three that appears again in chapter 20 um, that starts to tie some of those things together. Um, so, yeah, I think I think the only the only tip that I would really give people for and I think it applies for anything is to understand why your characters are behaving in the way that they are and what they want. Mm-hmm. So. Um, there's a this is going to sound very, very dull now. Um, there's a, a six sigma, which is a change management um, methodology. There's a six sigma tool called the five whys, which is literally um, like a five year old asking why over and over again to drill down into what really is happening. So it's used in change management to understand um root cause analysis this is getting really dull no it's not no it's not no Um, No, go for it so um it's used on things like production lines so you say okay why is my widget coming out of the production line the wrong size you say okay well is it because the machine is calibrated incorrectly yes well why is the machine calibrated incorrectly um oh because so and so wasn't trained on how to calibrate it well why weren't they trained um and actually your root cause isn't that the machine was calibrated incorrectly. The root cause is that you haven't been training people how to do their job properly. Yeah. So it's it's drilling down and keeping asking those whys. And so quite often when I'm plotting, I will go, okay, so you might know who the murderer is, but why have they done that? Mm-hmm. And then you come with an answer for that. But, but why? And it helps to... I suppose to kind of generate a backstory for them that works and that then really feels organic again because you are going down into the detail of why people actually do what they do. Um, which I think with psychological thrillers particularly, that why is so important because you can have the high concept, you can have the um, you know, in, in her perfect twins sense the you know identical twins and she's trying to get away with murder and, and there's there's a kind of high concept element to that but actually it all comes down to why she kills her sister and why she wants to then pretend to be her and that's where it gets interesting once you actually understand that and so that really helped me to drill down into some of the flashback scenes that you get in the book as to how their relationship had developed over the years so because essentially with her perfect twin you have to want her to get away with the murder yeah and that's really at the heart of it so you have to make it feel like maybe she wasn't quite justified in killing her sister but it wasn't it's not so where it came from yeah exactly yeah um so i think and I think it works with with all books, but I think particularly in thrillers, understanding that motivation is really, really helpful. And it can quite often flesh out ideas for other scenes as well. Yeah, when because you get the... other things will pop up and then you ah, now I can use that in this or that relates to that or whatever. Yes, exactly. So as we kind of move towards wrapping things up, if you were starting again tomorrow as a new writer, what, if anything would you do differently or what would you go back and tell your younger self do you think i think what i would tell my younger self is to read a lot and read far more than i was i mean now i read a lot mm-hmm. so i'd probably read somewhere 100 120 books a year something like that but there was a time where i was not re- reading anywhere near that much um and that is so important um partly because it helps you to understand what you like mm-hmm. but also it it helps you to understand what what the kind of limitations are of novel writing as a medium 
Um, and when you understand those limitations, you also understand how you can work around them in some way. So that I'd got to a point in Her Perfect when where I really, really wanted you as the reader to step into, because it's written in very close first person, but I really wanted you to step into another character. Mm. And I tied myself up for ages thinking, but you can't do that. <laughs> well, yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely fine. And it actually gets done quite frequently in a number of books. Just make it, re- as long as it's really obvious, yeah. it's absolutely fine. So, yeah, I think reading lots and in the genre that you write and wider than that as well. And also to not tie yourself up with the commandments that you will find about writing so if you go on to a lot of writing forums you will find you know the rules that you can't break and um, all of these things that you have to do people say you have to write a thousand words a day yeah write every day um, adverbs you, are evil all those things yes all of that stuff um you can't um you can't switch between first person and third person. You can't, you know, all of these things that people will tell you are rules and you cannot break them. You can, if you have a good reason to. Yeah. Um, and when you understand, and that's where the reading comes into it, that actually um, you do learn that all of these rules have been broken and any one of those rules you can find a hundred really good commercial examples of them it's fine. So yeah, don't tie yourself up in that and don't worry too much about some of those things that people will tell you are gospel because they're not. And I have, you know, I have days where I don't write at all. Mm -hmm. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, And I have days when I write stupid amounts, but I also once remember reading some writing for don't write more than 2000 words in a day. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like, okay. And it, (laughs) You know, it can become very, very prescriptive. Um, and then uh, some, I do, do you remember reading something where someone said, never write if you've had a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. That is really bad advice because I use my best writing off the bar. Yeah, it depends what you're writing. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes you need to just loosen your inhibitions just a little bit. You do. And it doesn't have to be wine. You know, whatever works for yeah. you. I, um, I have a friend who likes to go for a very long run and then write because mm. that um, kind of you know frees their creativity in a way um, that, that really works for them. So I think, yeah, just ignore anyone tells you advice that is gospel, ignore it. I'm very conscious that I'm now saying as the gospel, don't yeah, that That is a rule now. <laughs> ignore all the rules. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't listen to the rules. Um, and yeah just do what works for you isn't it really is the exactly that do what works for you trust yourself and get your work out there see if you can find a group of people who also write um is very very helpful uh even if quite often you just descend into just (laughs) giggling like lunatic she says speaking from personal experience (laughs) (laughs) yes Wayne and i are in the same writing group which quite often just descends into absolute chaos um (laughs) in a very good way and we forget whose work we're supposed to be critiquing that week yeah that's happened more than more than once (laughs) (laughs) didn't happen to you didn't it was it was it you we was, we think we totally forgot to actually talk about your work until the end of the meeting or something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it's happened to all of us, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, as we kind of wrap things up then, so why don't you just tell people when Her Perfect Twin is out, where they can find it, and also where they can find out more about you. So Her Perfect Twin is published on the 20th of January. Uh, in hardback and ebook and also audiobook. And I'm really excited about the audiobook because uh, we have three different narrators for the three different um, points of view that are given in the book. And I've not heard the finished version of it, but I'm super excited about it. I think it's going to be awesome. Um, so, and it will be available in all good bookshops. Excellent. Um, well, good so, luck with it. When this comes out, um, the book will be out. So 
go and grab it. I'm reading it now. I'm loving it. It's great. It's a page turner. I'll finish it in no time. So go out and grab it. But for now, Sarah, thanks a million for joining me on Joined Up. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Joined Up Writing There you go. Thanks again to Sarah, and I'll put all of her links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk, or you can find them in the podcast description on whatever device you're listening to this on. That's pretty much it for this week, but don't forget to get in touch with all your thoughts on the show, your feedback, and to tell me what's going on in your writing world. And you can do that by dropping me an email at wayne at waynekellywrites.com. Also, remember you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website, so make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube or wherever else you get your podcasts and that way you can have the podcast downloaded automatically every single time. Also remember to leave us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts or whatever else you listen to us on as it does really help others to find the show. Or you know, just tell some of your friends, that would be great. So that's it for this week, thanks for listening I'm Wayne Kelly, happy writing stay safe and I'll see you next time.